Hi everybody! Welcome again to this Lenten season devotional series called The Big Picture, brought to you by the United Methodist Pastors of the Catawissa area, Catawissa, Pennsylvania. I'm Pastor Sue Rogutsky, and it's my pleasure to be here with you and also to be presenting this devotional series along with my fellow pastors, Adam Miller and uh, Paul Kreischer. And so to each of you who've been tuning in with us each week, we are in week four now. March has arrived, yahoo! And so this is a time for us to continue studying about the journey that Jesus had to the cross. May God speak to your heart today as we gather together. Today we're gonna to learn about a really important and prominent man from the Bible, written in the Gospel of John, and his name was Nicodemus. Now you have to understand, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. And if you remember, the Pharisees were that group of uh, religious leaders who were probably the most prominent in New Testament times. We know that Nicodemus uh, was at the top tier of the Pharisees. He was one of 71 other Pharisees who served on the high Jewish council called the Sanhedrin. So get this. Nicodemus wasn't just a Pharisee, he was top tier, he was the creme de la creme. And if anyone knew how to interpret the Hebrew scriptures, it was Nicodemus. He was a politician, a lawyer, a priest, all rolled in one. And so I think that's what makes this story about this meeting between Nicodemus and Jesus so interesting. Because who is Jesus at this time? We know that from the gospel stories, Jesus was this itinerant peasant rabbi who had followers who were also peasants, who were tax collectors and fishermen, and he was really no one of great standing or prominence, and yet he was attracting crowds everywhere he went. His preaching and his teaching and his, his miracles that he was performing just had people taking notice. But the Pharisees were taking notice too because the things that Jesus were doing weren't quite along the lines of all the rules and the laws that the Hebrew, the Jewish people were following. Jesus was uh, going out and he was welcoming in the least, the last, and the lost in society. And that bothered the Pharisees too. And if you've read the story I'm going to read to you uh, from the Gospel of John, right before the story I'm going to read to you, we find Jesus is going in to the temple. And that's when he cleansed the temple by upsetting the money changers and the merchants. He drove them out of the temple. So needless to say, Jesus was not on the favorites list of the Pharisees. They saw Jesus as trouble. Oh, except for maybe one Pharisee. Again, Nicodemus. Nicodemus saw something in Jesus that the others didn't seem to see. And even he couldn't quite put his finger on it. There was something about Jesus that was almost otherworldly. I mean, what was he doing? What was he saying? And so I think that's why in the story I'm about to read to you, you find that Nicodemus goes to see Jesus at nighttime, by the cover of night. He was so top tier in the Pharisees that maybe he was worried about somehow threatening his uh, standing or his status. All we know is he goes by night and he's got to talk to this rabbi uh, who is just upsetting the apple cart. There's something about him. Would you listen now as I read from the Gospel of John, the third chapter, if you have your Bibles, uh, open up to the third chapter in John. We're going to start at the first verse. Listen to this story. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who's come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. 
Nicodemus asked, how can someone be born when they are old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. Nicodemus asked, how can this be? Jesus said, you are Israel's teacher and you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? This is the word of God for the people of God and we all say, thank you, God. So, Nicodemus, this authority on Hebrew scripture and the law, had no idea what Jesus was talking about. How can you be born again, he says. It's almost like, say what? What are you saying, Jesus? Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Nicodemus took Jesus' words completely literally, thinking of it in a physical type of uh, interpretation, and he doesn't understand. And so Jesus goes on and says, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the Spirit. And, you know, I think as Christians, we stop and think about that. It sounds kind of baptismal-y, doesn't it? Water and the Spirit. Aren't those the words that we say? We know that water talks about purification, cleansing, but water also talks about death. The idea in baptism symbolically is that you are baptized with water, you go under, and when you come back up, it's new life. And that's what Jesus was talking about. Jesus was trying to say to Nicodemus, you've got to leave behind old life and embrace new life. You've got to die and then live again. See if you get more of this when you watch this video clip now. This is of Nicodemus. Six hundred and thirteen. I had six hundred and thirteen rules to follow. Can you imagine that? Can, can, can you even understand how many that is? And, 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 and I, I knew every one of them, and I followed them, mostly. So there I am sitting across from Jesus. And he looks at me and says, Nicodemus, it's not about the rules. <laughs> I'm, I'm paraphrasing him, but essentially that's what he's saying. It's, it's not about the rules, not about the rules. Look at this from, from my perspective. I'd seen him come in the day before, and, and, and he had turned the temple upside down. This is the place, mind you, that, that I'd spent my life preserving. So you can imagine how much I wanted to have a talk with him in a secluded place at nighttime. How would you feel if someone Someone said to you, someone you respected, they tell you that everything that you'd dedicated your life to had missed the mark completely. You're a fool. 
That's how you feel. So I said something to him. I, one rule that seems too good to be true, because it was. Believe he's the Messiah. Believe he's the one that was promised. And, and he said it, like, he just glazed over it like it was some simple thing. And then went on talking about good and evil. And, and I'm thinking, wait, go back, go back to where you took what was so complicated and made it not complicated. My whole life was in those complications. My, my religion was in those complications. Making sure to follow the details of the laws. I made sure that every T was crossed. I thought that is what was going to save me. 613 laws. I was wrong. It was love that saved me. For God so loved. you feel if someone told you that everything you had dedicated your life to was all wrong? I mean, if you had lived for certain things and thought you were doing right, you were, you were doing all the right stuff, and yet someone came and said, you know, all that you've been doing, it's been wrong all this time. Nicodemus had lived this life following all the rules and all the regulations and he thought he was such a good Jew because of what he did, but he missed the most important part. And you saw it in the video, the love part. The part that Jesus taught, love God and love one another. Love? As long as you keep all those rules, isn't that what's important? I sometimes think the church falls into this, and, and it, I struggle to say this because as a pastor, I don't want to discourage you, but sometimes we think that if we make sure we go to all the worships and we make sure that we're on every committee and we make sure that we pay our dues, yoo-hoo, we've got it made. And Jesus would come along and tell us that's not what it's about. To be a Christian is to love. Nicodemus needed to surrender his old life to be born again into a new life of love. And, and he needed to realize that the Messiah that they had waited forever for was Jesus. Jesus was God come to this earth. So the question is, what about you? What are you living for? Is Jesus the one who shows you the way and the truth? Is he the one who is your Lord and your Savior? Are you living the kingdom of God? And maybe you're wondering, well, how does that work? If the kingdom of God isn't a time or a place, well, what is the kingdom of God? Probably the easiest way I can explain it is the kingdom of God is a way that we live. It is a mindset. I think I can show you this best if we pretend we go outside. Think of the kingdom of God this way. If you were to ask me, what is my least favorite season of the year? I would tell you, winter. There is something about the winter season that, oh, I don't know. Maybe it's the shorter days, the longer nights, the cold, the frozen ground. Maybe it's the fact that I'm wearing three layers of everything. 
Did I tell you that winter isn't my favorite season? Now, don't get me wrong. I like a snowstorm like everybody else, but I gotta tell you, there's something about winter that, I don't know, puts me kind of in a, a negative place. And yet in that dark place, Christ comes and shows me the light. Jesus saves me when I get in a dark place. The light of the world reminds me that I'm never alone, that I don't have to be afraid, that it's never too dark or too cold, that winter is always followed by spring. Outside, if you know, it is March. The snow is melting. <laughs> The temps are rising, the sun is starting to shine, the days are getting longer, and soon we're gonna be turning the clocks back so that we get one more hour of daylight. I can't wait. And already, if you go out and look, the bulbs are starting to peak up just even this much. Someone even told me the other day they saw a robin out there. It feels good. And so I'm trying to show you just kind of like an analogy. There's winter and there's spring. Now, did you notice the difference in my expression? For me, the kingdom of God is a state of mind. It isn't somewhere in the future. It's here and now. When Jesus came to this world, he came proclaiming the kingdom of God here and now. And what he said to you and me is, you can live this life, the kingdom life. So what does that kingdom life look like? I mean, it looks like what Jesus did in this world. It looks like love. It looks like kindness. And if you remember the fruits of the Spirit, it looks like love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. I think I got them all. That's what it looks like. It looks like gratitude. People who live in the kingdom are some of the most grateful people I've ever seen. And I'll bet you too. Do you live in the kingdom of God? We all know it starts with saying to Jesus Christ, I can't do it on my own. I need you to be my Lord and my Savior, and now I surrender to you. Have you done that? That's where it begins. This Lenten season is about self-examination. It's about looking into our own lives and making a decision to choose winter or spring. I don't know about you. It's not complicated. Just say yes. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, oh, we thank you, we thank you that we can gather together, whether it's online or in person, just to be able to remind each other that we are children, your children. We're brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. And no matter what's happening in this world at this time, we can choose light. We can choose springtime. We can choose to be people of gratitude and compassion and kindness. We can choose the way of the kingdom. Jesus, you said, I tell you the truth. And you said that so you, we would understand. This is important. I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Lord God, if there's any among us who have not yet begun that process, would you hear us now? We invite anyone who wants to invite Jesus Christ into their life to pray like this. Dear Lord, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us that we've wanted to be our own kings, our own messiahs, our own lords. Forgive us, Lord, because you are the one and only. Help us to surrender the old life for the new life. And we ask that as we give it up to you, that you will invite us into the kingdom where we can live as yours. So we ask that you would be our Lord and Savior and that you would lead us one day at a time, no matter what we um, encounter that is a challenge, 
that you would meet with us, walk with us, lead us. Lord, we want you to be our Savior. And we pray this in Jesus Christ's name. And everybody out there said a hearty amen. See you next week.